So, um, you also have one more section test um, left uh, this semester, um, which is also due December 9th at 11.55 p.m., five minutes to midnight. Um, I'm going to note also that this is when all of your discussion forms are done, so um, they, they, they close at 11.55, five minutes to midnight as well. So, um, if you're behind on those, be sure to um, it get get caught up in them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're all due at exactly the same moment, right? Um, which is which is why I've tried to give you a lot of time with each of these assignments. Um, it's like at this point you've still got a week, so and half a day or something like that, pretty close to anyway. But um, it's, uh, the other thing that I've done is I've actually truncated this final test so you're not doing a longer answer question. You're just writing these shorter answer questions. And um, I've weighted those out of four rather than out of two right? each. So that should be a little bit more lickety split with that. Um, so um, yeah, so this is all boilerplate. It's um, exactly the same as you're used to. Um, and so these are the tests, right? Um, it, it missed assignment policy. Uh, let me know in advance. Um, it's with the final, all of the final materials. I'm very, very limited with uh, regard to uh, what I can do in the way of extensions, uh, just because the office of the registrar demands my grades from me in a super, super speedy manner. Um, that, that will also mean you'll get way, way, way less in the way of comments from me. Um, I'd be more than happy to break down how you were assessed and have a long conversation about um, these assignments with you in January, right? Because I've got to get these grades in by um, the rather tight uh, deadline imposed by the Office of the Registrar, um, and there are a lot of you. And so I'm just going to have to plow, like plow through um, a lot of these. Um, I tried to, in your last assignment, uh, truncate the way that I was giving comments to, but a lot of you noticed that, you know, to a certain extent, I can't help myself. <laughs> and so I wound up giving comments nonetheless on the, the, the last assignment as well. So, um, but nonetheless, these will be just a grade right, on these assignments. But nonetheless, assignment submission, make sure I've got it. Right? That's, that's, that's on you. Uh, both email it and submit to Moodle if you're unsure. Uh, make sure it's there. Make sure it's the right file. Make sure it's complete. Make sure it's on time. Um, and uh, we won't have any problem. And again, the policy on plagiarism, finger wag, finger wag, don't do it. Right? So, um, two texts uh, for this assignment, um, and you've got a lot of video resources for this as er, uh, resources for this as well. You've got Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil and Jean-Paul Sartre's Existentialism and Human Emotions. Um, I asked you three questions about Nietzsche and um, two <coughs> about uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. First question relates to, um, remember right at the beginning of Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche was talking about perspectivity being that fundamental law. It comes up a few times, but nonetheless, I quote um, the passage on page four, right, where um, he says, of, of course, in order to speak as he did about the spirit, the good, Plato had to set truth on its head and even deny perspectivity, that fundamental condition of all life. Indeed, in the role of doctor, we may ask, what has caused such a canker on the most beautiful plant of all antiquity on Plato? Now, um, the example that I was giving you for perspectivity, Roderick goes into quite a bit of detail in his analysis of Nietzsche's perspectivism, right? But um, the example that I gave you was, remember I put the chair in the middle of the room and said in order to get a full sort of view of this chair we've got to look at it with essentially what Nietzsche calls many eyes from many different angles that sort of thing. Um, Roderick when he's analyzing perspectivity actually accuses sort of a Western philosophy and Western thought of a form of imperialism right that our 
way of knowing, our way of doing, our law, and even our moral law has to not just be good for us, but be good for everyone, every people, every culture, every individual. To a certain extent, we saw this with Kant. If you're a rational divine being or you're a rational alien, the categorical imperative is still supposed to hold. Right? It's not something about humans. It's not something about these humans here in a particular context. It's about rational beings, right? And it's sort of a form of imperialism. Nietzsche's reacting to that. He's effectively accusing morality and, in fact, Western science, right, of imposing its one single perspective on the whole of the world. Rather, what Nietzsche wants right, is us to see that there are many ways to look at a different situation or a different phenomena that are equally valid, that are, have the same sort of veracity. Now, I run into this in, in, in my own research quite often. I, I, I do research on cities. Right. And it, when we start asking the question, what is a city? Right, there are a number of answers that could come up. Some people see a city as an economic entry. Right? Cities produce, as Jerry Heron at uh, the Honors College of Wayne State actually argues, it's an engine to produce the middle class. Right? In some other cases, we want to compare it to, you know, a circulatory system, right? We see the city as an efficient way of moving people and goods and intentions through a, sp a physical space and geography. One way that whatever else you want to say about a city, a city is a space that we have to share, right? And as a result of sharing this space, a city has to be capable of handling strangers. So I tend to see a city as an ethical landscape. Who's right? Well, from a certain perspective, we all are right. right? But, you know, Nietzsche's point is that, you know, the way we tend to dispose ourselves to phenomena and the way that we tend to expose ourselves, especially to moral phenomena, is to lay out a canon of laws that are supposed to apply always and everywhere to the exclusion of all other ways of looking at that situation. Nietzsche thinks this is dumb and argues instead for what he calls perspectivity. Right? So um, basically what I want you to do here is um, call out this passage from Nietzsche in terms of perspectivity, analyze it a little bit, and then turn to Roderick's argument, um, which is provided in the video on Moodle, right? and um, analyze to the best of your understanding perspectivity as not a form of relativism, right? but rather as, as Roderick presents it, is a val valid sort of epistemological and ultimately ethical stance. Right? You see, this is the criticism of perspectivity. Right? My view, my moral view, is as good as yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and everyone, and everybody has their own ethics. That's not what Nietzsche is claiming. I don't think anybody in their right mind would claim that because it's a form of relativism. Right? And it, you have a hard time actually pointing to somebody who's actually a relativist. Well, it's all just like opinion, man. Right? Your ethics are good for you, my ethics are good for me, etc., etc. Right? Because that cuts off all possibility of conversation <coughs> about right or wrong or codes of behavior or the way that we should interact with one another in a world. It's a crazy position, and it's not the one. Nietzsche is adopting. Right? What Nietzsche wants us to see is that there are manifold ways that we can look at a particular situation. And in order to get an accurate judge of a particular situation, what we have to do is look at that situation from many perspectives and with many different kinds of eyes. Right? 
we tend to only take up our own perspective and enforce that one perspective on the world. Right? What Nietzsche is advocating is that we become capable of taking up a number of different perspectives. So, in that sense, I don't think it's wacky to claim. Question two, um, <clears throat> that passage um, that in the, 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 the minute ago on the, 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 the when talking about the, uh, the writing assignment, I, I, I read to you, it's right at the beginning of the, uh, the first section on the prejudices of philosophers um, <clears throat> related to the normative standard question. Um, uh, we do not object to um, uh, uh, judgment just because it's false, right? Um, I asked you a question directly about that. Um, page seven, Beyond Good and Evil. We do not object to a judgment just because it's false. This is probably what's strangest about our new language. The question is rather to what extent the judgment furthers life, preserves life, preserves the species, perhaps even cultivates the species, right? So effectively, I'm asking you um, on what, ba uh, oh, what, uh, what basis for judgment does Nietzsche suggest in the place of a true and false analysis? Uh, the answer is a theme of health. Uh, it's just how you cash that out. That, that is the question for Nietzsche. We should adopt values and ways of looking and ways of seeing and ways of disposing ourselves to our life that help us affirm rather than negate. Uh, so that's question two. Then question three has to do with that complicated four-part breakdown of freedom of the will that um, you get on in section 19 from page 18 through 20 of um, uh, uh, Beyond Good and Evil, right? And oddly, I'm just now realizing I didn't ask you a single question about the, the, the second section on the free spirit, right? I'm just now realizing that, but I think that's okay. We spent more time on the first section of Beyond Good and Evil anyhow. Right, so uh, Nietzsche lays out a four-part treatment of um, the will. Discuss this treatment, explaining all four parts in terms of Nietzsche's criticism of the free will. Right, so again, right, it breaks down to it, what I call sensations. He calls them feelings, right, or at least his translator translates that as feelings kind of thing. Right. Uh, he describes it as the condition uh, we're moving away from, the feeling of the condition we're moving towards, the feeling of this away and this towards, then the concomitant feeling in the muscles that without which are actually moving our arms and legs comes into play from a kind of habit whenever we will. All right. So, um, oddly, it, I've been thinking about writing a paper how this is this is very similar to what theorists call proprioception, which is our sixth sense, like acrobats kind of it, it, they understand their position of their body in space. Right. So if you're an acrobat or a dancer or something along those lines, this is one of the very important senses that takes into account all of your other senses. But nonetheless, I call it sensations for ease here. All right. Second. Uh, just as we must realize feeling, and indeed many kinds of feeling, as an ingredient of the will, we must also recognize thinking. In every action, there's a com uh, commanding thought, and we must not deceive ourselves that this thought can be separated from willing. Right? So we have a conceptual understanding of our situation. Right? Thinking is the second part of the will. Right? Third, the will is not merely a complex uh, of feelings or sensations and thoughts, conceptual understanding. It's above all an emotion and, in fact, the emotion of command. What we call freedom of the will, what we tend to call freedom of the will, Nietzsche, this is part of his criticism, right, um, is essentially the, mo the emotion of superiority felt towards the one who must obey. I'm free and he must obey, right? Now, this has two prongs for Nietzsche. Uh, the first prong has to do with, you know, the emotion associated in the act of commanding, right? that sort of thing, the reveling in the expression of power, 
right? And then secondly, the emotion that we feel after we have successfully commanded, where we pat ourselves on the back for being uh, the instrument that has actually effectively moved the will. Right? But if this is the case, the other side of the coin is, if there's something in us that commands, there's something in us that obeys as well. Right? So effectively, what Nietzsche is arguing here is that the problem of free will, when we congratulate ourselves for an exercise of the will, right, really, what we've done is only congratulate it is only acknowledged one aspect of it right that emotion of command that act of command right rather than the act of obeying and oddly when we congratulate ourselves for that act of command he says towards the end um, what's occurring occurs in every well-structured happy community where the ruling class identifies with the success of a community as a whole as we've said Every act of willing is sim simply a matter of commanding and obeying based on a, so a social structure of many souls. And for this reason, a philosopher should claim the right to comprehend willing from within the sphere of ethics, ethics that is understood, the theory of hierarchical relationships among which um, the phenomena of life has its origins. Right? So effectively, when we will, right, what we're congratulating ourselves for having done and what we're identifying as that act of free will is really just the pleasurable emotion associated with commanding and having commanded. But oddly, right, when I actually will, I haven't even really experienced that emotion of having commanded yet. You see that? It's sort of a funny thing that happens in Nietzsche. Right? So, if I'm going to congratulate myself for having commanded, right? well, that having commanded only arises after the act of the will. So, what we call will is really an emotion that totters along after the will. Really, the will is this tension between commanding and obeying. Right, between these competing sort of drives. Right? And it's for this reason that Nietzsche wants to get over this talk of free or unfree wills, but rather talk about strong or weak wills. Right? Because it's a contest. It represents attention. So, that's Nietzsche. You're done with that. Now on to Jean-Paul Sartre. All right. Uh, the first question has to do with um, this claim in choosing myself, I choose man. Why does Sartre make this claim? What does this have to do with anguish? All right. Well, he discusses this from page 18 to 21. There's a great passage on 18, and there's a great passage on 21 of your existentialism and human emotions. All right. So... Um, 18. Uh, first, what's meant by anguish? The existentialists say at, uh, oh, well, the passage that I quote there is from page 18 in Choosing Myself, I Choose Man. This is, uh, this is just a consequence of uh, the existentialist credo that existence precedes essence, right? Essentially, in our choosing and in our acting, what we're doing is we're defining, and we're not just defining ourselves, but we're defining human. Right? Because we're an unfinished product. Right? So effectively, we don't have a set nature that defines us. We define ourselves as we exist. Right? And as we choose and express our freedom. But we define ourselves as a species through each and every one of our individual choices. Right? So in choosing myself, I choose man. Now, why should we be anxious about this? What that means is this, the man who involves himself and who realizes that he's not only the person he chooses to be, but also a lawmaker who is, at the same choosing all of mankind as well as himself, cannot escape the feeling of his total and deep responsibility. Of course, there are many people who are not anxious, but we, uh, we claim that they are hiding their anxiety, that they are fleeing from it, which is a funny way of saying that they're in bad faith. Right? Now, effectively, 
we define humanity with each and every one of our choices. With each and every one of our choices, we hold ourselves up as a paragon, as though to say, I'm choosing this because this is what a human being should do in a situation like this. So when I make a choice, it's not a personal thing. I'm saying everybody ought to make this choice. Right? So this is, this is why um, Sartre points out on page 20, for every man, everything happens as, as if all mankind has its eyes fixed on him and we're guiding uh, itself by what he does. And every man ought to say to himself, am I really the kind of man who has the right to act in such a way that humanity might guide itself by my actions? And if he does not say that to himself, he's masking his anguish. He's in bad faith. All right? So it starts really saying that we should be anxious. This is a lot of freedom and a lot of responsibility. All right? So, right, anguish is that realization that we define ourselves and humanity through each and every one of our choices, right? So we're absolutely free, but absolutely responsible in this crushing kind of sense, right? We should feel anguish with each and every one of our choices. And when we don't, we're simply evading uh, the deeper understanding of what we do when we make a choice. So, that's question four on start. <clears throat> then question five. I just love this passage, page 41. Uh, oh, interesting that, interestingly, um, that's where he raises the objection, right? You're able to do anything no matter what. Right. This is I presented this as uh, the relativism charge to existentialism. Right. If we're free and in the bright realm of values, we're forlorn. And really, if there's this despair and that sort of thing, it seems as though all things are possible and nothing's prohibited. Right. I could stand on my head and teach this class. I could just walk out of here and be done with it. Right? It doesn't matter. All of these things are possible. All of these things stem from my freedom. And there are no objective values, no a priori values, as Kant would say, that really hem in our particular actions. Right? So it seems as though all of our choices are absurd and arbitrary. Right? Now in 42 over to 43, right, uh, what Sartre does is he compares ethics to art, right? Compares ethics to painting, right? Using the example of a canvas of Picasso. Now, effectively, in the, the realm of art, we know that really uh, the, the art is an expression and, and an invention of the freedom of the artist. Nobody actually accuses that art of being arbitrary, right? Like the canvas of Picasso or Monet or Degas. Right? We don't call these things arbitrary right? because we understand that Degas, Picasso, or Monet are in a sense creating themselves as they create their art. Right? And really, it has a certain kind of consistency as art as it's produced in this sort of relation between the artist's intention and the finished product. Sartre claims on 43, the same holds in the ethical plane. What art and ethics have in common is that we have creation and invention in both cases. I cannot decide from before uh, what is, uh, there is to be done. I think that I pointed this out quite sufficiently when I mentioned the case of the student who came to see me, who might have applied all of the ethical systems, Kantian or otherwise, without getting any sort of guidance. He was obliged to devise his law himself. Never let it be said by us that this man, who, taking affection, individual action, kind-heartedness towards a specific person as his ethical first principle, chooses to remain with his mother, or who, preferring to make a sacrifice, chooses to go to England, has made an arbitrary choice. Man makes himself, he isn't ready-made at the start, and choosing his ethics, he makes himself, and for some circumstances is such that we cannot abstain from choosing one. Now, what Sartre is arguing here is that, you know, the interesting thing about ethics and art is that in both cases, 
we have to create an action that meets a particular situation. And dusty old Kant or dusty old Mill or dusty old Aristotle can't help us with that. There's no way to evade the fact that we are choosing in a given situation. It's not as though there are rules that govern our action, that excuse us from our action, that take the responsibility for choosing off our shoulders. We have to invent it. We have to do it ourselves. Because there are no values that stand over before we act, right, that doesn't mean that our actions or their moral value is arbitrary, but it arises rather from the context. In a given situation, it's applying Kantian categorical imperatives or hedonistic calculus or the principles of Aristotle's virtue ethics. Well, even applying to these various systems, well, we're still choosing. All right? There's a simple example that I used to use um, to, 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 to sort of illustrate this element of Jean-Paul Sartre. You ever decide, okay, I'm not going to choose, I'm just going to flip a coin to decide? So up goes the coin, down goes the coin, and it comes up tails, and you go, darn, two out of three. Mm -hmm. right? you're, you're not really letting the coin decide. First off, you've let, uh, decided to let the coin decide. And then secondly, the fact that the coin came up in a situation in, 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 with a disposition, with a choice that you didn't want, doesn't relieve you of that choice. It just illustrates the fact that you are choosing, you are acting, right? In both cases, effectively, you're creating and inventing a choice by creating and inventing yourself through the choosing, right? So uh, that's, that's what ethics and art have in common, according to Sartre. It's all, it's all on the creator, the inventor, the artist. That's you. So anyhow, that's the test.